the FBI, which is exactly how he ended up reacting. Yeah, we were very worried about that. It was a extreme, an extremely uncomfortable kind of conversation to even talk about. And Jim Comey and I had spoken many times in the past about the negative legacy of Director Hoover with respect to... things, you know, having to do with blackmail and that type of thing. And we, over. Yes, exactly. And so we were very, very worried about uh, creating any type of impression like that. But yet we, th our information was this, inf this was about to leak in the press. Some elements of the press had this. It was going to come out. And we thought that would be even worse to know this information, know that it was coming and not tell the president-elect. So we, we just decided this was the right thing to do and went forward in coordination with the rest of the intelligence, uh, leaders of the intelligence community. What about the whole impression that William Barr, someone you worked with in the past, is now giving by investigating the investigators? They say it's a review, but it is basically putting on, on trial, on defense, the people who launched this investigation. So we all recognize, especially Jim Comey and I have spoken many times about the need to hold us accountable, to hold the FBI accountable. The FBI has a lot of power and responsibility and needs oversight. It, it needs it. And I've had many reviews uh, conducted by the Inspector General in the past and, and others and welcome that. It seems strange to say that, but we welcome that. And so, you know, the Attorney General needs to be comfortable that the, that the agency has the right policies, procedures, protections in place to make sure that, that the Bureau is doing a good job. And so he's entitled to conduct legitimate review. Um, Rod Rosenstein, now that he's left the Justice Department, has called Jim Comey a partisan pundit. Um, has Comey been too out front? He's a private citizen with First Amendment rights like the rest of us and uh, can say what he wants to say. That's, that's what I, would, I guess I would say about that. And Cherry Nadler was just on the Hill and was, as you know, Nadler and the leadership, certainly Pelosi, were trying to quell the rush to impeachment hearings, but they're not getting the information they want. They're fighting these subpoena battles. They might have a better leg to stand on legally if they do start impeachment hearings, despite the political risks there. This is what he had to say today. The president's uh, policy now, the president's posture now, is making it impossible to rule out impeachment or anything else. Uh, the letter we got from the uh, White House yesterday uh, is beyond outrageous. It said that we could not investigate, we could not speak to Mueller, we could not speak to McGahn, and we could not, in fact, speak to anybody uh, about this, and they said we should shut the investigation. The White House does not seem to recognize or does recognize and is doing this for political purposes that Congress has a completely different mandate than Mueller did. Mueller was mm -hmm. raising issues of whether or not there should be prosecutions, as I understand it. Congress has oversight over whether there needs to be legislation, whether other issues are at hand here. Congress has a different role. Congress has a huge amount of power. But the Constitution itself is actually a sparse document, especially with respect to relationships between, the, between Congress and the executive branch. And over the years, there's been accommodations, customs, and practices that have, adopt, that have been adopted. The president is simply uh, not going along with those, I guess you would say. And so now Congress is left with a sort of raw core Article I authorities, and it needs to figure out how to exercise those effectively. How does it feel to be attacked on Twitter by the President of the United States with his millions and millions of followers? How has that affected your life? It's pretty horrible. It's a, like an out-of-body experience when it first happens. Uh, you kind of get you get kind of get used to it. Uh, I guess uh, it did have an effect on my uh, on my career because some uh, potential employers said to me, "Jim, we like you. We'd be happy to hire you, but you're too controversial." So it had that effect. The final thing, though, is it it actually did. It was very rewarding in a strange way because friends of mine stood up for me uh, in a variety of formats, and so it was wonderful. It was almost like a Jimmy Stewart moment at the end of uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" for me. Just just like extremely emotional for me in terms of friends standing up. So that was that was the great and weird downs or uh, the great and weird upside of it. Well, James Baker, thank you for your service and for your continued uh, efforts to enlighten all of us about this. Thank you. I hope Thanks it's the beginning me. of a number of conversations. Thank Thanks you so much. And we have some good news to report about America's oldest former.